Uh, good morning, GNC family and friends. Good morning to those who are tuning in from different parts of the world. It's always a blessing to have the opportunity to come and share the word with you. And I just want to thank you and offer you a word of blessing. May God continue to give you the increase that you need through the teaching of His Word, so that you could grow and become the person that God always uh, desire of you to be. Uh, today we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 and uh, Matthew chapter 16. And I hope and pray that as we go through what we will find in this part of Scriptures, that we will... Uh, see something that will have an impact in our lives, in my life as well as yours. Now before we get to the Word, let us uh, talk to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of your Holy Spirit, I am very honored to share your Word with those who are watching and today, Lord, as we come uh, before you, I pray that you will allow me to share your word, the word that has been uh, put in my heart, that I will be able to bring it to them in ways that will help encourage them. Lord, I ask that the presentation will be simple and clear as you've always done in the past and that whoever is listening in and in any part of this presentation Lord that you will speak to them that you will talk to them in a language that they will be able to understand so that after this presentation they will find something new or be reminded of something they forgot something that will Take them from where they're at to the next level. To open doors to them, to give them a new vision, new understanding. Something that will help them as we continue to live through the troubling times that we are in. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for opening your word to us. May your truth live on, and live in us. Those who are watching in, Lord, I pray that they will have the courage and the strength to listen and be able to understand. Thank you, Jesus. It's always an honor to share your word. Amen and amen. Well, the message for today, uh, something like this. You are now the rock. Leave the dream, follow the calling. You are now the rock, leave the dream, follow the call. We're going to focus on Peter. It's a familiar name in scripture and he's a favorite of some of the Christians. He's a wonderful man, a man that uh, set a good example for us to follow and my goal here as I try to relate the message to you we're trying to look at uh, his life and trace his steps back and I'm hoping that as we look at where he came from and and uh, some of the things that he accomplished in his service of our Lord that you will find some valuable lessons for your own life, that you will see yourself in him, the struggle that he had to go through, that you will find that relating to you somehow. And the goal is to, for you to find encouragement and inspiration. We're living in troubled times and uh, the call of God to all Christians to rise and step up is uh is very loud and clear that it's time for us to 
make some adjustments in our priorities and uh, ask ourselves, what is it that is most important to God? I know it's no accident that you will run into this program and that you're listening in. These are all works of the Holy Spirit leading us to a place or a moment where we could hear the Word of God and the cry of God for each and every one of us to that it's time for us to, to go out and, uh, and do exactly what we feel is the God of God in our lives. Now a lot of times we live uh, our dreams. We follow the dreams, we focus on the dreams, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I would like for you to know that there is something bigger than the dream. That when God calls, it is something special. Now as I look at Acts 2, Peter stood up as the first preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will read about his sermon. It's a very long sermon, a lot of details, a lot of good stuff. But I thought that I should uh, look at the beginning of the chapter 2 so we could get an, uh, an understanding of the context upon which he was speaking from. Now let me read to you from uh, Acts 2 verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were seen. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, uh, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. What was happening on the day of Pentecost is a well-known supernatural phenomenon. Where people from time to time will look at it and understand this as the beginning of our Christian church. When the Holy Spirit arrived, as Jesus promised, Jesus now is in the heavens. We've got the Father sending the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit arrived. And at the start, this Acts tells us, the Holy Spirit came upon those who waited on the Holy Spirit to receive power from upon high, beginning to speak in other words tongues as the Spirit enable them. Now before I get to Peter, I must offer a side note that I think it's important for you to understand so that you don't confuse yourself with the tongue speaking that Acts talks about. This is a different kind of tongues or different kinds of language 
From the language that we find in the book of Corinthians, the first Corinthians where Paul talks about speaking in other tongues. The language for the tongues Acts talks about are the spoken language, like Samoan in English. This is the kind of language that people already spoke. It can be taught. It's understandable. If you want to learn it, you can learn. You won't be able to speak it. That is the tongues of the Holy Spirit in this book of Acts. Now when we go to the book of the Corinthians, that's Paul. This is Luke. Now Paul is not talking about this kind of language. He talks about a language that is unintelligible to the mind, that the mind cannot understand. You cannot teach it. You cannot learn it. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It comes out only when the Holy Spirit allows it to come out. In the book of the Corinthians, when it comes out, it's paired up with the gift of interpretation where the one speaking in tongues or a different, this kind of language, it's instructed to find interpretation. Otherwise, you are not allowed to use that in the gathering of the church. In the book of Acts, when people heard the language spoken to them, what they heard was a declaration of the wonders of God. That's Luke. This is Acts here. When you go to the Corinthians, it does not talk about a language that declares the wonders of God. It talks about a language that talks about the mysteries of God. You see the difference? I think it's important that you don't confuse the two. You keep the two separate. That is the intention of Scripture. You don't read one into the other. It's a mistake. It's a mistreatment of the word of the truth. So for those who are listening in, I hope and pray that you remember that. Next time you read it, make sure you don't put the two together. They are different. They are separate. Keep them separate and you will have a proper understanding of Scripture. Now the Holy Spirit is coming upon the group. Manifestation of the Holy Spirit through the different languages spoken, heard and understood by different people that are gathered to celebrate the day of Pentecost. It's a festival day for the Jewish community. But now for the first time they got to have an experience. They never had before. And there were some of them that were confused and didn't think that was, that was all that great. They thought that people were drunk. And when they made fun of the experience, Peter stood up and used that as an opening line to address the group of people that gathered on that day. And as you read the entire chapter, you will find these words Starting off by telling people what you're hearing today is not an experience of drunkards, of people that are drunk. But this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of a prophet. A prophesy that made a promise some 500 years ago that the Holy Spirit will have the gift, will have the office of prophets. Well, the word of prophecy restored back to the community of the faith only in the season that he, he called the final days of the last days. The final season in the human history. This is where everything ends. And then Peter was able to break it down. The first part talks about the Holy Spirit pouring out on all women, discriminating nobody. On the basis of gender, now speaking as himself from that prophecy. He said, this Holy Spirit is upon men and women, sons and daughters. And then the last part of that prophecy talks about the day of the Lord, the judgment day of God. So you got the beginning and the end of the final season in our human history. Now spell out to mark the beginning 
of the church. It was a very powerful, very moving sermon. After that, then Jesus, then he talked about the Jesus of Nazareth. Not too long ago in that experience, people could remember Jesus that carried his cross, crucified, remembering him, and then talking about him coming back to life. So the what happened to Jesus was still fresh in people's memory. And now Peter is going back and said, the very Jesus of Nazareth that you people crucified is now the same Jesus that sent the Holy Spirit. And then he went on and on. The sermon was so moving and so powerful. It touched the hearts of people that heard it. Towards the end we find Acts telling us 3,000 people came to the Lord, were saved, accepted Jesus and their Lord and Savior, baptized in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through the sermon of Peter. But it's not the message of today that we discuss the lessons of his sermon, but to look at his life and ask the question, where did this fear come from? Who was he? How did he get to become a man of God selected by the Holy Spirit to speak the very first sermon of the church? It's a historic moment for the church to finally say to the world, Jesus Christ is here. His name is the name that will bring salvation to all mankind. You listen to him, you accept him, you call on his name, and you will be saved. The Holy Spirit is here to give you the guarantee that every mention of his name comes with the power of life that everybody needs. The message of forgiveness that will forgive us of our sins if we choose to accept what he has to offer. Now the church started that ministry to save lives, to bring people back to God, help them turn their lives around. That message started some 2,000 years ago. Today, it's still going strong. I have the honor to do this myself in my time as I'm speaking to you, listening to me. It is the same message of truth. That was spoken on that day, but that was the first day. This world heard the declaration of the wonders of God and an explanation that is simple and clear enough to, for people to hear, for people to receive and accept to the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Again, I wonder, who is this Peter? Now when we look at Matthew 16, we find where he came from. Before he was Peter, he was Simon, the son of Jonah. He was a fisherman. He had his own boat. He had his fishing crew. Uh, he owned his own uh, fishing equipment, he had a net, and all of those tools that are needed for, uh, for fishing. And I want to say that at the time, when you think about he was a part of the fishing industry, it's not far-fetched to think that it was a dream of a young boy to grow up and become a fisherman, to own a boat and and join the fishing industry because it's a very good business. Help raise a family, help provide for what the family needs. So now Simon growing up, that was probably his dream. When I grow up, 
I want to become a fisherman. I want to own my own boat. I want to have my own crew. I want to go out. I want to join the industry. I want to catch as many fish as I can catch. Get married. Have a family. And I'll tell my wife, don't worry about anything. We have a very secure, very reliable business. So when we found him as already an adult having his own boat, got his business going, he was living a dream. That was his life. There was nothing more. There was nothing to hope for. The future is right there. There's nothing else. It's just uh, helping to expand the business and maybe add more boats. I mean, that's probably... A natural thing to do. So his life, that's all there was. The kind of talk he will talk about fish. His mind was all fish. His ideas are all about fishing. His hopes and dreams are all in the fishing business. But then Jesus appeared. And everything began to change. Jesus brought him and he was a part of his close circle of friends. We call them apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ. That is the beginning of Jesus' movement. Starting up the organizing of the church that we are a part of today. And there was a conversation that took place in chapter 16 of Matthew. Well, Jesus asked them, who do you think people say? What do people say who the Son of Man is? Son of Man, that's him. Now he's talking to his disciples and said, who do people say I am? So they started to have a conversation. And some said, well, we heard that some think that you are John the Baptist. Some think that you're Elijah the prophet. Some thought that you're Jeremiah. While others are thinking that perhaps you're one, just one of the prophets. Then Jesus looked at them and said, What about you? Who do you think I am? And that's when Simon spoke up and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Messiah is the anointed one of God. The community, the Jewish community have been waiting. These are, are people that expected the coming of the Messiah, the anointing one of God. And now, while nobody knows who he really was, who he was, or if he was around, or if they're still waiting for him, Simon said, Lord, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. In other words, no man could have told you this. You would not have figured it out yourself. You went on, but my Father in heaven. Jesus is saying to him, Simon, my father spoke to you. He revealed my true identity to you. You would not have known it if my father did not wish to reveal myself to you. Then Jesus went on and said, and I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is where the Peter, the Pentecost, started his journey to become the first preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first sermon 
of the Christian church. He started as Simon, the son of John. But now Jesus is saying to him, a man who was living the dream, a man who saw nothing else other than fishing. But now Jesus is saying, you are able to receive this revelation from my father. In return, you are Peter. Now Peter means rock. You are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus talked about the church that we're part of. Those are his words. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now watch this. Jesus is now is giving him a new identity, a new life. Showing him a new path. I call it the call of God call of Jesus now call him to leave the dream and follow the call and it's not a small thing you're talking about the heavens getting involved the underworld is also involved the church in the middle giving him the keys the kingdom of heaven it's not a small responsibility. This is a big job. He was just a fisherman in a very small city. That's all he did. But now Jesus is opening the world to him. Say, Peter, you're Peter now. You're the rock. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. First of all, listen to this. Jesus is the builder of his church he did not call Peter to build the church no he gave him the keys of the kingdom of heavens his job was to bind and lose bind and lose it is Jesus that built the church it's Jesus that sets the parameters where he will have to operate within those parameters. You cannot do anything outside of the boundaries that Jesus, because Jesus is the builder. I hope that we don't confuse our roles here. Because sometimes we tend to think that we could introduce new things into the church and still be fine. No, the builder has his word that gives us guidance and authority. Show us the way teaches us instructions what to follow and what not to follow so when we do the binding and the loosing we do it within the parameters that Jesus has said that's why when you see all these new practices coming in all these new ideas coming in we don't have room for it in the church because it's go, it goes against the will of the builder. Now, Peter is in action now. The Simon is gone. It's Peter now with the keys in his hand. The man, Peter, has got an assignment and he did not want to wait for the next day to start work. He started right after that. Jesus now turned to the disciples and said, look, this is what's on my agenda. This is the next thing that I need to, to do, go through. I'll be presented to the hands of my enemies, crucified, and I will come back again. Right up to that, Peter now, the big one. Not Simon, but Peter, the keys. He said, he pulled Jesus on the side and said, Lord,
Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Watch what's happening here. The journey from the Simon son of Jonah to the Peter of the Pentecost. Very discouraging. Very disappointing. Peter acting as Peter. But according to Jesus, Satan got to the rock. And now Satan is manipulating him. Using him as a tool. And according to Jesus, this same Peter, the rock, upon which the, the church is built, the one holding the keys to the kingdom of heaven, given the responsibility to bind and to lose. Now what is he doing here? He's trying to teach the builder something. He's trying to offer the builder an advice. He's trying to tell the preacher or the, the builder of the church what not to do. And Jesus responded, Satan, you are a stumbling block. The very rock at the start was a stumbling block to the work of Jesus. This is a good lesson for us, church, because Peter represents us. This is us in him. This is the start of our involvement, our participation as humans into the work of God. We don't tell Jesus. We don't even advise him. No, he's the builder. What we do, we take instructions from him. We may offer prayer, but we don't make compromises with him. We don't bargain with him. We don't try to change his mind. No. He's the one telling us to change our minds. He's the one telling us where to go. What to do and what not to do. Right from here. Peter made a mistake. As Peter. Not a Simon anymore. Then we move on to the, the other part of the turning. It was close to the time when Jesus will be presented to the hands of the enemy to be crucified. And they had a they had a Passover supper. And somewhere in that gathering, Jesus started telling them that the time is near. And then Jesus went on to tell them, look, there is a prophecy in the prophets that is going to be fulfilled tonight. Where the prophets say that uh, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus talked about himself and his group, including the Peter. Where Jesus said, look, it's going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. We just have to wait for it and move forward. Now upon hearing this, this Peter, the rock. The rock disagreed and said, even if all fall away on account of you, Jesus, I will never fall away. Where Jesus responded, well, I tell you this, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter, still coming strong, and said, even if I have to die with you, Lord, I will never disown you. This is Peter speaking. A young man with a huge responsibility, having in his hand the keys. The kingdom of heaven. With an awesome responsibility to bind on earth what ought to be bound. 
loose on earth that whatever he does on earth will affect the operation in heaven. And now, behaving, acting is part. And Jesus said, it's not going to happen, Peter. Then Jesus was arrested. He was on trial. And we found him coming in while Jesus, when they brought Jesus in. And, and during the steps, the process of the trial, Peter was sitting, according to Matthew, was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. And she said to him, you're Peter, you're the rock. You're the guy with the keys. Kingdom of heaven. You're the, you were with him. And the rock said, I don't know what you're talking about. Then he changed position, he went to the gateway. And another girl came to him and said, You're the rock. I saw you with him. You're, you're the guy with the keys. They have it. He responded, You're wrong. I don't know the man. Then he changed position again and people came and now more people are coming. They could see him and they could hear his accent. The talk of the rock. They came to him. They heard him talking and said, we could tell from your accent that you're, you're the rock. You're the Peter. And then Matthew tells us he start cursing. I don't know this man. I never knew him. I was never with him. And as soon as he said that, that's a three times. He disowned Christ. And then the rooster started to crow. It hit him. He went outside and wept bitterly. The rock. Who tried to follow the call. But fail. Who left the dream to follow the calling? And we see nothing but disappointment. Those those are very crucial moments. Those are moments when Jesus really needed support. He failed miserably to do it. And as you go on with the story when Jesus was carrying his cross, he was nowhere near. At the cross when he was thirsty, we don't see him, we don't find him. And where is the rock? What happened to the rock? What happened to the guy who has the keys of the heavens, the kingdom of heavens in his hands? What happened to the guy entrusted with this huge responsibility that affects the lives of the entire world? Where is he? Then came the day of Pentecost. Jesus rose from the dead, brought them back as if nothing happened. You don't find scripture where Jesus will rebuke them of the fact that they, that they got scattered, they left, they abandoned him. No, he already told them that's the fulfillment of the prophecy. Jesus continued moving forward. All came in, they had a discussion with him. Jesus was able to spend some time for a few days before he left. And before he left, he said to Peter, Peter, don't leave Jerusalem. You stay here. I gave you the authority to go out and make disciples in all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey every word that I tell you. And I make a promise that I will always be with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. 
Then Jesus was taken up into the heavens. Wait for the Holy Spirit. They waited. Then the Holy Spirit descended on that day as we just read in the book of Acts 2. Holy Spirit fell upon each and every one of them, including the rock. And then something happened. This is the same rock that Satan used as an instrument to stand against what Jesus Christ was trying to do. This is the same Peter, the rock, who made a promise and broke his promise to the Lord. The same rock that was all talk but no action, he's owned Jesus three times. I didn't mention the time when Jesus went to Gethsemane and he was praying and he brought Peter and the other two guys to give him support and help him pray for him. Awaiting the moment of the arrest, Jesus came back to find him sleeping, the rock sleeping. And he said to them, look guys, I thought that you're going to pray with me. Jesus came back, they were sleeping again, the rock. But now, without fear, now, with so much power from the Holy Spirit, he was able to stand up and address the many people that came on that day as a result. God was able to save the 3,000 people through him. The rock. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Given the keys to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, with instructions, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The faithfulness of that Peter, living behind his boat, his dream, following the calling of Jesus Christ along with others that Jesus put together along with him to present the message of hope to the world their faithfulness their commitment their willingness and desire to follow the calling gave us the church that we are so privileged to be a part of today. And the examples that he set along with others. As we read of their stories. We receive the encouragement and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When we compare their lives. In this case the life of Peter. When we look at the struggle he had to go through. When we see the flaws. The disappointments, the discouragement, the embarrassing moments. We see ourselves in our time, in our turn. And as I was preparing to come to share the word of God with you. I cannot help but wonder. Who is going to watch this message? Who is going to listen and receive this word? Who is going to see himself or herself in the life of this rock? Because in understanding of scriptures, this is not the only rock in the church of Jesus Christ. This is not the only one that God, that Jesus called. No, Jesus at every generation continues to call. 
continues to call and remind all of us who are saved of this calling. And I look at you and think, you're listening in. You're probably living a dream. You've spent a lot of years in your life to build up yourself. You laid out some steps, you've taken those steps, you set some goals, you're able to achieve those goals, and, and now you've got into a very comforting place. You got it all, you're happy, you're on vacation when you have time, your family's well off, you got a very good marriage, you go to church, pay your tithes, and you give your offering, and you do your part. But deep down in your heart, you know that there is a calling of God in your life. But he didn't think much about it because he thought that the dream was bigger than the call. If you could make a comparison, contrast, comparison with your life and the life of Peter, the question is, do you see yourself in Peter or see Peter in your life, in yourself? A young man with a dream, but now call. Why is it? Why is it so significant, especially in the the days we're in? Why do you have to worry about this? The message of Peter it's about the end of days. That was some two thousand years ago. We are closer now to the end of the end of days than ever before. The world population now is 7.7 .7 billion. We have more unsaved people on the planet than ever before. We see the fulfillment of all those prophecies coming in our time. Where Jesus took the time to tell us that the end of days Natural disasters will come. We've seen that. As a matter of fact, we're in the lockdown in all most of the places in the world because of the, the pandemic. It's a natural. It's a natural occurrence. It's a natural disaster. Then we got violence everywhere. People killing people. Protests and whatnot. You have bombs, explosion, and all this going on. But make no mistakes that every time we see nature and society behaving in ways that are threatening to our survival. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact that the spiritual disaster is a lot more deadly than ever before. Because what takes place in the realm of the spirit shows up in the realm of nature and society. We are a lot, we are a lot closer now to the end of the ends. The call of God now in our lives as Christians is a lot louder today than ever before. That God is calling us to get on a platform and preach our last sermons to say that which was lost. That we go into our homes in ways that we've never gone before. That we speak the message of hope to our families in ways that we've never spoken before. Why? Because it's our last sermon. The end is coming where no man or woman will ever have the need to speak the message of hope again. This is
is the time. You've been saved for a while. You've been having some thoughts about the call of God in your life. But what is happening? Why aren't you moving according to the call? What's holding you back? Is it the disappointments of the past? Is it the ugly defeats of the passing time? Is it the failure you tried? You gave it a try once, tried the second time, the third time. You sincerely believe that that's the call of God, yet you try to move, it did not move. Perhaps that's what happened in the case of Peter. Peter wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to operate. He's the rock. He knew he was the man of God. He needed to operate according to the call of God in his life. The word that Jesus spoke to him on that day affected his psychology. Instead of thinking as a fisherman, instead of thinking that he was Simon, the son of Jonah, he transformed his mind to think that he is now the Peter of God. The problem was he did not factor in the journey, the process, the work of the Holy Spirit where growth and character building does not happen overnight. It's an intentional process where Peter, you, me, ought to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit came upon him. That is the answer to the problem that he had. This could be the answer for your problem as well. You tried and failed, tried and failed. And now you're disappointed. Perhaps you're confused. You begin to second guess yourself. Thinking that perhaps this is not the real call. That you were just. Uh, it's just a thought. It's just a feeling. What if it's the Holy Spirit that is missing? The work of Jesus Christ. In the church. Through us. Is always the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the cheese, it's Jesus who builds. And we know the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. Builds through the Holy Spirit. In America there is a there's a book that has I, mean, I talk about this one. Some time ago, it's called The, the Rise of the Nun, N-O-N-E. It has affected the, the younger generation and the coming, the newer generations that are coming in. Where people will consider themselves spiritual, but they don't want to deal with the church. They don't want to be a part of the church. They don't want to, they're tired of the church. And it's a new rising moment. And the, the population increases over time for those of you that are watching from different parts of the world you probably every time you watch us in america you see a lot of people flooding when they have into places where people gather for crusades and you got the the so-called mecca churches here in america i have nothing against that but i have to tell you to be honest with you the church here in america is is dying numbers continue to go down. So what you see could be very misleading because these mega churches are built upon the shoulders of the smaller groups. These are all people that were, they're all Christians. Now they're coming together, they want to be a part of something huge. They don't want to deal with the small groups. But I'd like to submit to you from the start, Jesus started with a small group. And the early church is always home church. 
small groups. Not the kind of small groups where you're contented to think that once you're part of it, you're a small group for your life. For 20 years, 30 years, stay small. Not, not that kind of small group. I am talking about a church that started as small and then grows. I'm talking about the multiplication of smaller groups. The point is, we need more Peter today than ever before. We need people who really understand the word of scriptures to tell the people about the truth of God. You see there's a lot of people preaching, but not all of them are the true and honest preachers of the word. That's why the call now, it's urgent. We need honest Christians who will take the baton of leadership for Christ to learn what they speak to do and act out what they give people, what they tell people is their life. That is the word today. Living out the word of truth. We need people. We need you. And the call of God is not a surprise. He called Peter, he called the Simon of that day. He's still calling us today. And that's where we got our message. You are the rock. You're watching this. Who knows? Maybe it is you that compel me to bring this sermon to your attention. And as Jesus directed his remarks to Peter within the group, it's amazing now like, that I'm not in a chapel. We're not in the chapel where I will be glancing over people. Not having the moment to really focus on the individual, but now it's on a on your phone. It's more direct now. I could actually appeal to you in the comfort of your home, in your car, your own space. And I now look at you and I say, Simon, son of Jonah, today you are the rock. But the question is, would you leave your dream and follow the calling? Did you know that the culture is a lot stronger now that has affected the way people see the world now than ever before? And now it's turning people to a perspective that is hostile to the work of God. That people now are, we have more lukewarm Christians than ever before. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. I cannot emphasize enough the desperation of the church in our time to raise young men and young women who are sold absolutely for the cause of Christ. Yes, living your dream is good, but it's only good for this planet. When this planet goes down, it will take all of our dreams and our accomplishments with it. And our scientists have told us the planet itself is dying. Now, when you look at NASA, I don't know if you're familiar with that group. These are the top-notch scientists, astronomers, and astronauts, and all those people getting together. They're trying to send robots to the planet, to Mars. Planet Mars, trying to find if, if it's possible for us to move there. Our resources are depleting. They are, we're losing a lot that cannot be replenished. They're sending spaceships out to different parts of the, the galaxy trying to find if there's a, a place that's like us, like the earth, so we can move to. You see the desire now we have as a human race? The call of God 
It's the call to prepare the human race to move to a better world that God has prepared for us in the same way he prepared the planet that we're in. Do you see where I'm going with this? Now watch this. And you are called to become a huge part of this movement of God. You are called. What an honor it is to be called along with Peter and all of those great men and women of God that came before us. Still calling, looking to us to move according to the plans of God to save our world. Our message today, you are now the rock if you heed the call of God. Leave the dream and follow the calling. It does not matter how young, how old you are. You know, some people will, will say that they have to take care of business before they turn to the Lord. Today is the call of salvation. If you never heard Christ before, you heard it, but you never made a choice to follow Him, today is that call for you. But when you become a Christian, God has called you to be the rock, the Peter of your day. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for the word. I know there's at least one or two of them that are listening in. Now through the examination process, retracing the steps, looking at the journey of the past, where they're at now, and if there is one of them like in the situation of Simon turned Peter, Lord, I pray for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. It is your Holy Spirit who gives us the power to rise, to take a step forward, to show our face and do what we must while we still have some time. Thank you, Jesus, for opening our minds and our hearts to your word. May your people that are listening in take this word and think about what you just said. I thank you once again for the opportunity to share your word, to hear it and understand. Give us the strength and the courage to act upon it. Forgive our sins, Lord, as we forgive those who sin against us. And as your Holy Spirit continue to dwell in our lives, our hearts, minds, and soul, may we have the power to live lives that are worthy of your calling, lives that reflect who you are, Lord, in our lives. May we continue to develop through the guidance and direction of your Holy Spirit the character that is worthy of your name. Bless those who are watching, your healing and your peace, your grace upon them. In your name, Jesus, I ask. Amen and amen. Well, thank you once again for those of you that are able to join us as we continue to worship the Lord and also to receive His Word. Uh, special thanks to those of you that are uh, supporting this ministry by sharing the video and getting the word out to families and friends that may need it. Those of you that are sending messages and questions and comments, and we appreciate your support. And uh, today the message is, you are a part of this calling. You are a part of this calling. You are the rock of your generation. I hope that you will make the right decision. The calling of God is the biggest thing that you could be a part of during your days here on earth. May God continue to be with you. Keep your home and your family safe. And tonight is our service in Samoan at 6.30.
So I hope and uh, trust that you will be with us. But if you're not able to make it, the video will always be there for you to come back to it and watch it in your own time. May God continue to be with you. Uh, special thanks to our local GMC church for your tithe and offering. We are so grateful for your love and your support for our ministry. Continue to do the good work and the things that you're doing to keep our ministry together. Regardless of what's happening around us, it's not going to affect us. So keep holding on and do what you do so that our people will receive the grace of God from the Lord. Uh, thank you once again, in Jesus' name, amen.